here and your interest on this really great webinar topic. And I'll start in just a moment. Okay, I'm going to start the recording and we'll get going. Thank you for joining us for the webinar, Grand Canyon Greenway from Vision to Reality. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 234th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And this webinar is being recorded. It includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. And um, you will receive a link to the quiz as well as the survey in the chat box. And you can turn on captions by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And if another language is ever needed, um, just let us know. So attendees will receive a follow-up email from me within two days that will include a link to the recording, the transcript, a resources slide that will include the presenter emails as well as learning credit details. I'm, I want to thank our webinar partners today that include Visit Long Beach Peninsula, the Professional Trail Builders Association, iZone Imaging, as well as the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, and the USDA Forest Service. And I am happy to introduce our presenters for today. We have Jeff Olson, who is the co-founder of ReCharge. We have Chuck Flink, who is owner of Greenways, Inc. And we will also have... Um, a presentation, a video presentation via uh, with Peter Axelson, who's the owner of Beneficial Designs. He will be joining us via a pre-recorded video presentation that we will share during today's webinar. And we also have a couple other videos from original members that we will share at the end too. So I'm excited to pass controls over to Jeff to get started. Thank you, and, and thanks for American American Trails for hosting this uh, this webinar. Um, this is a story that's been decades in the making. Um, and took some pretty extraordinary efforts uh, to get us to the point we're at now. And um, it's, a, it's an honor and, and uh, a great privilege to be part of the team that helped make, uh, make this happen. Part of what's important about this story is that when we go back to the, the beginnings of the Grand Canyon Greenway, our movement, the Trails and Greenways movement uh, here in the United States and globally uh, was a much smaller thing than it is, uh, than it is today. And part of the purpose, the intent of this project was to do something significant that would create a lasting legacy for generations to come, to be a catalyst and a model for future generations, to prove that, that the ideas that many of us had at the time could result in tremendous change, uh, cultural change, organizational change, change in people's ability to enjoy and visit some of our, our most treasured places. And whether that was our cities that we live in, uh, the communities that we're in, or, or trails that were you know, longer distance or in more natural settings, that there was a role for greenways to play um, as we try to address some of the major issues that society is facing and continues to face, uh, whether that's climate change, equity, mobility, accessibility, mental and physical health, all of these challenges, greenways are one of those things that can help us uh, to try to move forward. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, this project has a longer history than those of us currently involved in it, and it goes back even beyond uh, uh, the, this quote from, from Teddy Roosevelt, uh, generations uh, of peoples who have lived in this region long before our time. Um, but when you think about that, that simple statement that to do nothing tomorrow it's grandeur, keep it for your children, your children's children, and all who come after you, the one great sight which every American should see. And I would argue that it's one of our great gifts to the world. And I would hope people from, from every country get a chance to visit and enjoy the experience of the Grand Canyon. Um, that has not always been the case. And it has been very difficult for large numbers uh, to have that experience. And we go to the next slide. Um, there's a great paradox that, is, that has come about in modern society. It applies not just at Grand Canyon, but at many other places as well, that we have increasingly numbers of people who want to go to these places. Uh, we want to improve that experience, both for people and nature. And how do we do that if, uh, as you can see from this image, uh, most of the investment has been moving people in cars and it has degraded the experience, the environment. Uh, it has resulted in some very, very difficult 
difficult conditions uh, for the people who manage our national parks, people who manage our cities, uh, and and really all the other places we live our lives in. So this is a an important change that represents a much, much bigger set of problems. But the idea at the time was that if we could make this happen at Grand Canyon, that millions of people from around the world would come and experience something new and different that they would take home with them, that would create a ripple effect of change uh, throughout, throughout the world. We'll go to the next slide. Um, we get to a moment, and this photo is probably 25 years after the one before it, uh, the Kodak moment. It took us so long to get to the point where uh, Chuck and I and Peter and the rest of the team that worked on this project, uh, not all who are still uh, still with us and we and we miss them, um, but but representing that group, we got to go back in November and see firsthand what that change has been like for those millions of visitors and to experience that transformation in a way that uh, I think far exceeded even our own uh, expectations and belief in what we could accomplish when we first started the project. So. Uh, hopefully, this is one of many, many Kodak moments for many, many people who get to stand there on the rim of the, of the canyon in quiet and peace and reverence for the great place that the Grand Canyon is. Next, please. I'll, I'll take you back a little bit to sort of the origin story personally and how this project comes about. Uh, my wife is a former National Park Ranger, worked at the Grand Canyon. Um, and in 1990, we were out, out west, my first trip to the American West. Um, and uh, uh, friends of ours just had told us they were going to get married at the North Rim. And we ended up going to the wedding. And they were early adopters of mountain biking. And we went to go out for a mountain bike ride. And the very first thing we did was leave the park. We drove the perpendicular road, perpendicular to the rim, directly away from the rim of the canyon to get into forest service land, where it turns out we were, in fact, allowed to ride bikes on the trails. And when I asked uh, the other friends who were with, who were rangers and former rangers, um, why that was the case, the answer is, well, there are no trails to ride bikes on. Bikes are prohibited um, from riding on trails in the National Park. And, you know, uh, Easterner that I was from upstate New York, I just could not understand that. I could not believe that that was true, that we couldn't do better. And I started to follow what the park was doing. Uh, as it turned out at the uh, campfire following the wedding the next night, we uh, met. I met uh, one of the people we ended up working with, Brad Traver, who became general manager for implementation of the general management plan that you see on the screen um, that was released in 1995. And when that happened, we'll go to the next slide. When the plan came out, I, I contacted um, absolutely cold, had never met him in my life. I wrote a letter to the then superintendent of the park, Rob Arnberger, one of the great leaders any of us have ever had a chance to work around and we've walked through fire for, um, who immediately wrote me back or called and said, you know, who are you? Um, is what you're talking about serious and, and can we meet? And what I had proposed was to bring together a team of volunteers, the early leadership of the Trails and Greenways movement uh, at that time. Um, I contacted some of these people and started to say, let's put a team together and do this project as a gift for this country. And our target was to do the project uh, by the year 2000. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So next slide, please. Uh, things go very quickly. Uh, we do, in fact, meet. Uh, the park agrees to accept our offer. Um, and we start assembling a, a team that is, um, I, I can't say enough about these people and the effort that we put together, uh, probably, uh, you know, other than maybe some teams in sports, but, uh, you know, teams I've been involved in, definitely the greatest, uh, many of whom went on to be uh, some of the top leaders in, in, in our field. And in many different directions, this project became a catalyst for us uh, as individuals, as well as, as for our movement. Um, we first met at, a, at the Pro Bike Pro Walk Conference in Portland, Maine, um, and quickly proceeded to start setting up the, uh, the the team that would lead the project. Next, please. That resulted in a significant public-private partnership uh, that evolved with the Grand Canyon National Park uh, and their internal team, the Grand Canyon Foundation, uh, which is now known, known as the Fund, um, and the Greenway team, those of us that had volunteered to give our time. Uh, we were invited uh, the following January to go out and start working. We were given basically three days to come up with a concept of how could this general management plan loose concept of a greenway be turned into reality. And uh, we worked for about 50 straight hours and uh, ended up producing a concept that we presented to the superintendent and his team on, on a Monday morning. And immediately the superintendent said, this is the greatest gift I've seen given to the National Park. Um, I was born here and raised here, and, and he was superintendent uh, at that point in his life. 
um, and and said, let's make this happen. And, and I remember him saying very clearly at the end of the presentation, we're going to keep this team together. And of course, everyone turns around looking at me like, keep us together. Right? We thought we were just coming out here for three days. You know, now now what are we in for? And, and that was uh, Superintendent Armberger's really key phrase that he would always say at tough moments, now we're in it. And I think that sums it up really well. So we keep going. Next slide, please. Uh, and we start trying to sort of solve the impossible. How do we get through this maze of incredibly difficult technical challenges, cultural challenges and getting agencies and supporters to believe in the project. Funding certainly was a major issue at that time. We had nowhere near the level of resources that now exist to make these kinds of things happen. How do we engage philanthropy? How do we make sure that everything's built sustainably, that it's fully accessible? And as I said, you know, the great thing was that we had a team of people that were at the forefront of solving exactly every one of these difficult problems all came together all worked together and really made this project happen. So we'll go to the next couple of slides. We'll talk a little bit about some of the details. And as we get into the presentation today, you'll hear more from Chuck and, and from Peter about the, the real nuts and bolts of how that design happened. I'm gonna kind of give some broad overview today, but you know, the basic, the, the, the vision that we were trying to create was to try to utilize the resources that were available to try as much as possible to connect people in nature in a way that didn't exist at that time. Most of the overlooks on the South Rim were connected by road and parking lot, and people drove very short distances, a quarter mile, a half a mile to dozens of overlooks, and were trampling the, the landscape on the rim. Uh, on the North Rim, there really was no way to walk from where the, the lodge is to get away from the rim to the other trails that are there. And there was a trailhead just a, a mile or so away. You couldn't get from the rim to the campground without walking on the road or on, or on sort of trails that were uh, made informally. They weren't necessarily designed for that for that use um, and had been you know, eroded quite a bit. So the idea of getting that peace and solitude and the ability to connect with the canyon once again in a way that pre-existed that sort of automobile era infrastructure was our big challenge. We go to the next slide, the key elements of the solution. Um, and there were pieces of this from the ground up that, that you know, in the if you look at the early copy of the Greenway plan that we produced, uh, Margo, my wife, actually came up with the idea of, uh, very late one of those nights that we need an interpretive theme that's got to make sense that connects all this together. And it was called the Trail of Time. And if you go to the rim now, you can see that geologic history explained along the rim of the canyon with markers that teach you and explain how that geology has evolved. And uh, we needed to make sure that people who came there without the equipment they might need, whether that's bicycles or strollers or wheelchairs, would have access to that, that the ability to have that be completely accessible, that if you're using a, a National Park Service bus, or if you were walking or on a bike or a scooter or a wheelchair, that you would be able to now have access along the rim. And that one of the key pieces of that was that up until then, the vast majority of the trails were oriented down into the canyon. And many people were hiking down into terrain that they did not really want to be in, that might not have had the skills for, requiring rescues frequently and, and overtaxing the Park Service staff to do that, um, providing that easy experience along the rim opened up the park in an entirely new way. Next, please. The design principles, and then I'll go into the next slide, will be the, the, the components of the Greenway, are, are fairly simple and very classic, I would say. We spent a lot of time looking at how do we use native stone and materials. In fact, we engaged the, the, uh, the tribal community to help us build benches from locally harvested timber in what they said was the first contract that their nation had had uh, with the United States at that point. It's a very moving piece of this project that everything was designed with a, the word intimacy comes up and, and rhythm and variety and syncopation. The idea that we could make this project sing, that it could be beautiful, that that storyline and interface was so natural that uh, when we were just there last month and asked Park Service staff who are currently working there about the project, they did not know this story. They did not know that this project had been originally developed by a team of volunteers, uh, that our time had been valued at a quarter of a million dollars back then, um, that, that all this had happened. They believed the trail had already been there. It had been there all along. And when you see all these pieces of the cairns and the, the connections and the trailheads and the way the bridges are designed, and, and that all of that is accessible, uh, to the fullest range possible of, of, of people, that part of this trail connects the Arizona Trail and allows equestrian use uh, to travel through the park, 
uh, that connects out to the adjacent communities, all that got done in a way that uh, it's probably the greatest compliment we've ever had is that it looks like it's always been there. Next, please. The development plan that we produced, uh, and this has the, the, the dates that we worked out there uh, in 1997, um, that photo was taken by Andy Clark. It was the first time he'd seen the Grand Canyon. Um, it's all right, Jack, go, go right ahead. Well, next, it, it, we produced a fully detailed budget. We literally went out and helped raise the money, both from public, private, and from philanthropic sources. sources. Uh, Grand Canyon Greenway was the first major uh, trail funded with transportation enhancements money in the state of Arizona at the time. And just to show you the graphics of what that system looks like. So you know, here's the, the South Rim and the North Rim Village Greenway. The change has been completely transformational. The experience is one that did not exist before. Uh, at Mather Point at the major visitor center, there's a bike, uh, wheelchair, stroller, uh, rental uh, operation that has hundreds of bikes, including e-bikes now. Uh, at the North Rim, uh, the former gas station is now a bike rental shop. And the experience is prioritized around pedestrians on, along the rim, especially in the busiest areas. Uh, the greenway that more people are wheeled use are on uh, come back away from the rim. And the North Rim is the island in the sky, and it's just this beautiful, idyllic place to visit, much less visitation. The greenway there is very simple, but it does in fact connect the campground, the hotel and, and the very uh, necessary functions that are there. Um, just this project has so many twists and turns in it, we won't be able to tell all of them today, but a major one is that in the middle of it, um, because of the work on this project, um, I was uh, tapped to head the Millennium Trails program for the White House. And uh, my career took a very interesting uh, change um, and was able to then lead a national trails initiative that included the Grand Canyon Greenway. Uh, this photo shows our team actually signing a historic agreement on the North Rim with the Park Service, the Grand Canyon Foundation, uh, and the Greenway team. And we signed a letter that we sent to the President of the United States saying that we wanted to have this trail open on July 4th of the year 2000 as a millennium gift to the United States. That happened more than a year before there was a millennium initiative launched by the White House. And uh, when the White House started thinking about how to frame that program, this became central to these are the kinds of projects that we could do. This is the kind of legacy that trails and greenways that our nation can produce and, and give as a gift to the world. Um, and to say that we were able to accomplish that is really uh, an extraordinary uh, lifetime uh, achievement. When we just look back for a moment, I just want to transition this into the next couple of presentations here, is that you know, we were able to overcome obstacles that were so significant. The, the image before this, before we get to the ribbon cutting, there was a plan to build a light rail line along the rim of the canyon, which was going to be a billion dollar project. Nothing near what the Greenway could accomplish for, for a $10 million project. And you know, to think that we're going to build a rail line along the rim wasn't the right thing. It's not the right experience. People don't want to be cooped up in a vehicle at the park unless it's using it to get somewhere to that great experience. There was a major plan for transforming the entire central area around the Grand Canyon Railroad uh, into a heritage education campus that was also a roughly half a billion dollar project at the time. And here we came with this thing that cost a fraction of any of that that could get done in a quick period of time, but it wasn't easy. And I can tell you, uh, we'll get to this maybe at the end. I'll Chuck, go to the next slide of the dedication. We did in fact get there with the First Lady of the United States um, and dedicate that trail uh, you know, as part of the Millennium Initiative. It did help link the Arizona Trail across the, across the Grand Canyon. But I can tell you from that point forward, the project didn't keep going. We had a roughly eight year hiatus where very little got done. Uh, we had tremendous problems dealing with changes in administrations and leadership that just didn't see the value of what we were doing. And it wasn't until 2007 when I was out there uh, with my wife and kids on a trip to the North Rim um, late in the evening um, after dinner at the, at the restaurant uh, at the Grand Canyon Lodge we're walking back to the campground and I was so just disappointed. You know, this great project, we got all the way to that point and then nothing's happened. And we're walking through the woods and all of a sudden we come on a construction site with earth moving equipment and what looks very much like Peter Axelson's design for this difficult transition and ramp section. And there's stonework going on and it's, it's getting dark and there's no one can explain to me what had happened was just a month before a new superintendent had come in dusted off the plans, rounded up the donors who had said they were interested and said, this really was important. Now let's get this done. And so this project went through more of that than uh, we can tell you in a, in a short uh, presentation today. But the important thing is that it's there now. And we just had the chance to go back and see it. 
as a team. And that's what Chuck and Peter are going to talk about uh, in this next section. We'll come back to you for Q&A later. But uh, just bear in mind that if there's one phrase that this project always reminds me of, never give up. It's not over until it is done. It's never going to be easy. If it was easy, somebody else would have done it. Assemble a great team of people. And, and you know, Margaret Mead's quote always holds true. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. So thank you to everyone who's been involved and to the millions who now get to see and enjoy this place. Take this idea home with you. Chuck, over to you. Jeff, thank you so much. Um, we're going to go into some of the key uh, design issues that were we could we were confronted with on both the north and south rim. But to to kick us off, we uh, we spent I spent some time with Peter. We we did a recording. Peter was one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable, members of our team, and he brought a perspective to this whole project that was just amazing. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Candice and let her play the video that I recorded with Peter uh, about a week and a half ago. And Peter's gonna reflect on his contributions to the project. Okay, Peter, take it away. Hi, I'm Peter Axelson with Beneficial Designs. And uh, I'm gonna talk about the Grand Canyon Greenway uh, project and the, how the accessibility issues were just considered and brought into play when we did this. And uh, I am in a wheelchair, obviously. I had a spinal cord injury when I was in a training accident at the US Air Force Academy. And basically my career was redirected into designing all sorts of assistive technology and uh, some of the initial Things that I worked on were adaptive ski equipment, like this cross-country art articulating cross-country ski with a kick and glide uh, motion. And uh, got involved in my first student project was actually designing uh, the first hit skis. And our company built the first model ski in the world with a shock absorber and mechanism to get up and load onto a chairlift and right now i'm actually at the va winter sports clinic in snowmass colorado that's why i'm not uh, live on the presentation with you uh via video uh here i'm loading onto a, a chairlift and this is one of the issues that's going on here and tomorrow we have four service engineers showing up to look at the the access issues with getting on and off of chairlifts or trying to make sure that they continue to stay uh, accessible. But when I'm not out in the snow in the summer months, I'm out in my hiking chair often. In this case, uh, this is up on Mount Washburn in uh, Yellowstone National Park. And there was a meeting that took place down in Jackson, Wyoming, where the discussions were taking place as to how. Were we going to, now that the ADA had just been passed, this was right after 1990, uh, discussing with the Park Service and the Forest Service and lots of other interested parties, how we were going to make trails accessible. And I didn't believe that we should be paving the wilderness everywhere, uh, that we wanted trails of all different types and surfacing. And so um, I got this idea while I was sitting there, the idea of creating sort of a nutrition food facts label for a trail that would have information about the, the trail and the conditions on the trail. And I thought, you know, I came up afterwards and said, you know, I think if we could systematically record the length and the width, and the cross slope and the grade and other conditions on the trail, we could make this information available for people. And this should be done with, you know, typical rec front country recreation trails, which are often not very accessible for someone in a wheelchair and even for a parent with a stroller, it can be quite difficult negotiating trails like that. And shared use paths certainly would have an expectation of a higher level of access. They're usually, you know, five to 10 feet wide. And um, very often as a wheelchair user, that type of trail can be uh, negotiated. And possibly on a, a hand cycle or, or a bike as well, if those are allowed in that area. So I developed this trail assessment process. We called it the universal trail assessment process. We used real simple tools, 
such as a roller wheel, uh, a smart level chronometer compass, and we would systematically train people to go down the trail and make these measurements as you went along and record them uh, to create the information. So here's a smart level being set down to measure the cross slope on the trail. It's 2.8% at that location. And what we discovered was that the surfacing on the trail was one of the greatest barriers to access. It's a surface that was soft in any way. It made it extremely difficult uh, for people with different types of mobility impairments to negotiate the trail, particularly for wheelchair users. And you know, we're like, well, how do we characterize that? And we thought, well, if you can't leave a mark on the trail, if you, if you can see if it's paved, obviously concrete or asphalt. But if it's hard and you can't see a mark, it, we'll call that hard. And if you can see a, a, a footprint from the boot, it's firm. And then the soft, if you sink in and very soft. So we, we developed an objective device, the rotational penetrometer with a precision spring in it and a caliper to, to measure the indentation of the indenter into the surface to get a firmness reading. And then rotating that indenter back and forth, twisting it into the surface would allow us to uh, determine what the stability of that surface was. And so we now have we had an objective way, objective way to measure everything about the trail. So we would, then we developed signage uh, with our graphic artists and artists from Montana State that near Yellowstone and, and the uh, Gallatin Forest where we were doing all our pilot work. Um, we came up with ways of calculating the typical grade, the maximum grade and intermediate grades. And same thing for cross slope, we'd get a typical cross slope, a intermediate cross slope and maximum cross slope. And tread width, we were looking for the minimum tread width um, that would exist on the trail as well as surface conditions and surface type and the firmness and stability, which we could measure and uh, fractions of an inch, you can see the minimum there on this particular trail is 0.4 inches. Stability uh, minimum is uh, 0.73 inches. So that's, you know, sort of, that's getting more toward the soft side is moderately, moderately stable. And uh, then we would note obstructions on the trail. This one's got multiple rocks that are 18 inches in the trail. So, I always asked at that time by Jeff to be part of this Grand Canyon team that was gonna gather to try to, to see what we could do about accessibility of trails and to create a trail system at the Grand Canyon. And I was pretty nervous about the whole concept because in my mind, this is what I pictured was trails that were gonna be like things that you saw goats, mountain goats on, not, not people or certainly wasn't something that I could picture that I would begin to be able to negotiate in my wheelchair. So I was pretty, pretty nervous about, you know, what, what kind of experience is going to be available for me there at the Grand Canyon. So when I got there in my everyday chair at first, uh, had to get some ropes out and attach them on the chair to get a pull, getting around it. It was uh, challenging at times to, uh, to get around there and it was uh it was january i think of 1997 and there was still there was some snow there and um got to get around and wow i was just blown away by what what the views were and and really wanted to know figure out how could i begin to move along that rim of the canyon to see some of these places because it was it was pretty exhausting mostly because I was getting in and out of the car a lot. We were driving to different viewpoints and lookout points and waiting for the guys to get my chair in and out of the car and get in the chair, take a look, you know, move on to the next site, drive there, get back in the car, out of the vehicle uh, to look at these different sites. And it was, uh, there wasn't really a way for me to move along the canyon. So I got back into my hiking chair and, the team literally was dragging me through, helping me through the desert to try and figure out alignments that were going to work to be, you know, reasonably uh, accessible. And it was uh, it was challenging. I was getting some pulls and pushes and 
making our way through, figuring out how this was gonna, gonna work. And the guidelines that were come up with, we were, they were just draft guidelines at the time we were doing this, um, but the guidelines actually became part of the Architectural Barriers Act Accessibility Standards. Chapter 10 on underdeveloped areas. The Forest Service actually has a has very very similar guidelines with pretty much the same numbers. The Forest Service Trail Accessibility Guidelines and their Outdoor Recreation Accessibility Guidelines. And these guidelines, which you can access on the internet for these three sets of guidelines, all represent the best trail guidelines you can use and that are available at the present time. And I'm just gonna skim through them real quickly because this is what I told the team we needed to try to do in our work is that we were gonna try to achieve, you know, less than 5% wherever possible on the gray, but we needed to, to exceed it. We wanted to make sure that every, you know, if we if we were in the five to eight percent range, we wanted to have a level landing every every couple hundred feet, or we didn't want to. We want to, if we had to exceed that, you know, up to ten percent, we were only going to want to go about thirty feet. And if there was a drainage swale or something, we would we would limit that to about ten feet, up to twelve percent there. And then the cross slopes, we would try to keep to two percent when we were on asphalt or boardwalk or anything like that or concrete and uh, if it was unpaved we would we would go up to eight up to five percent for for drainage purposes so those resting intervals are important because that's where you can stop and and take your hands off the hand rims and not go flying down the hill again and we wanted those areas to be there for people to be able to take a break and so these rest intervals were designed into the to the system of trails that were built, they were planned so that you could sit and rest and off and look out at some of these sites and um, see the see the uh, beauty of the area. And uh, my team members there, did, and uh, being able to uh, to uh, enjoy those those spots. So we needed to make sure the minimum treadwood was always. 36 inches and of course on what we were doing with our work we were shooting for more eight to ten feet so that it was more like a shared use uh, path experience more of a greenway type type experience we wanted to make sure that there weren't obstacles in the trail and that any openings were kept to a quarter inch versus this one's almost a foot it looks like <laughs> to get across and we wanted to make sure the surface was firm and stable and so that's why we were uh, the goal was to have asphalt um, to maintain a surface that would remain firm and stable over time. So when I got to go back with the team, when we went back in in November last year to see the system of trails, it was absolutely fantastic to to see how I could get around. And uh, I was out there on the trail seeing other wheelchair users and families and groups uh, Making their way along the rim of the Garam Canyon, where the where the path here comes up close to the edge of the canyon and and separates away and meanders back and forth, and it was just spectacular to see there. I'm looking uh, down the trail with Bob, one of our team members, and uh, you know here's Dan uh, asking me questions about stuff. He's always trying to learn more about how to do things better, and so we were just exploring this whole trail system network that we had literally taken 20 years to get all the elements built. I was learning how to use the bus system that's completely accessible to get around to the different uh, loading points and unloading points to make, make your way around the area. And the, uh, the seats flip up and to secure a scooter, power chair, manual chair on those buses to move around. And it wasn't until after I came back from that, I found out that for one section of the trail, at, at the very least from Monument Creek Vista uh, to, to, to Pima Point and then out to Hermit's Rest, that there was this signage available. I was constantly asking the bus drivers now, which way is more downhill? Is it this direction or is it this direction? And do you think I can, you know, would I be able to get from here to here? And 
Um, I got off at Pima Point at the end of the day and I was asking so many questions. The bus drivers were actually concerned and so they were uh, told me that they had called me, called the fact that I was going uh, to Hermit's Rest from Pima Point into the superintendent's office and they wanted me to make sure that I called in when I got on the next bus at Hermit's Rest to let them know I'd gotten there safely. Otherwise, they were going to come looking for me. So it was quite an adventure um, not having been on the trail since since looking at the drawings that I'd been reviewing from Chuck at various points through the project. And uh, it was it was a uh, it was an adventure. It was toward the end of the day and I was looking for some other groups that might come along and and uh, in case I needed the help, but it, there was just a couple sections of grade that, that that took a little bit of effort. It was like it, but nothing that felt like it was right around that 8.3 percent and some of those deeper sections. And was able to make it out to Hermit's Rest and and uh, get some help into the gift shop there that's still working on getting accessibility. But this is the type of signage that we want to see for the whole all the trail system uh, where we've got basically the average grade by four percent there and then they've got an intermediate grade that shows that uh, 0.6 miles is between five and eight point three percent and then and then there's another 0.4 miles that's that's at eight point three percent and uh, the average cross slope is two percent the tread width is is uh, typically five feet there. And then you can see there's a trail profile as well, which is very helpful to know. You know, I'd see, hey, it's a little more downhill from Monument Creek to Pima rather than going from Pima up to Monument Creek. So that would help me decide, you know, where I might get off the bus to hike that section of the trail. And so this is the type of trail access information that we'd like to see available on the whole uh, trail system. So when I got back, I posted this on the uh, internet so that I could pass this information about our our reply. And there were actually um, 2,600 replies. There were 40,000 people uh, that actually responded in some way to it. And um, I I so this this is what I said. I said just two weeks ago on the 13th and 14th of November. I was able to return to the south rim of the Grand Canyon with seven of my teammates who worked together in the late 1990s to design and plan our dream for an accessible trail and greenway system along the south and north rims of the Grand Canyon. The idea was to enable people of all abilities that did not necessarily have the skills, ability, or desire to hike into the canyon to have a way to hike along the rim of the canyon to experience this amazing place without their cars to get everywhere they needed to go. The staff at the canyon was mostly thought that this was a great idea as well. And most of our team members had never seen these trails completed until we returned together. It was really exciting to see so many people of all abilities being able to hike and walk and roll along the south rim of the canyon. Back in 1997, when I needed my off-road hiking chair, with other team members pushing and pulling me through the brush to figure out where the alignment of the trail should go. It was challenging work. Two weeks ago, when I was there, I wanted to see where I could go in my everyday wheelchair by myself and on the completed trails. Most of the paved sections of the trails and greenways are less than 5% slope, and there are steeper sections where there are level landings at intervals that are now specified in the ABA. Architectural Barriers Act Accessibility Guidelines. These new standards took about 20 years to complete as well. I was honored to help write them. Rolling along miles of accessible trail along the south rim of the Grand Canyon, meeting so many wonderful people from all over the world was a blessing to me. Hearing contact stories and seeing other wheelchairs and the users on the trail allowed me to see that the new accessibility guidelines for outdoor recreation were working. People now seem to be planning their vacations to come to the South Rim now that everyone can experience the joy of moving through time together along the rim of this amazing canyon. So you can 
if you want to see any of these other 2,600 replies, if you just go to the Grand Canyon Hiker uh, group on uh, Facebook, you can you can access some of this information. These are these are some of the responses that I got from uh, from people as I was uh, uh, scanning scanning. If someone actually helped me go through all 2,600 uh, uh, replies, another Facebook a uh, friend that I that I have met and corresponded with she went through and and found them all so we could grab these pictures Becky uh Frankel Fritz says thank you we love being able to take our sweet daughter to the Grand Canyon we so enjoy the south rim and you can just see how excited she is with her arms out just looking at this young woman with cerebral palsy enjoying this this uh beautiful view on the canyon uh, Susan Armstrong Walker, thank you. My son enjoyed seeing the Grand Canyon so much. So you can see how people want to be seen where they are, where they were, able, where they were able to get to, and where they were able to be photographed to say, "Look, look, I got to Eagle Point. I'm here, uh, you know, 4,000 feet above the Colorado River." My, my Michelle Barron, thank you. We will be coming back to find these trails. We're so excited to get out there and enjoy the experience having a wonderful hike on on the ground that the that the wheelchair can can uh manage this one's from uh from a lovely cruise stopper thank you so much we were here two years ago super enjoyed the the grand canyon with my my husband who is also in a wheelchair due to spinal muscular atrophy so you can see how excited people are and wanting to see you know, their joy over where they are. Michelle Poocher Woodhead, thank you. We're able to take my daughter. She's a C6-7 spinal cord injury from a jet ski accident five years ago. We went from one end to the other. It was very accessible and we had an amazing time. This vacation meant a lot to us and to her. So this is just really incredible families, Jan Janet Mings. Uh, thank you, you know, wanting to show, you know, we came here as a family and we were able to experience this together as a family. Gina Marie, Gigi Giovanni, you know, thank you for your work. Uh, visiting the Grand Canyon from Wisconsin was a bucket list dream for my dad. And those pa paved trails made a three generation trip possible, accessible and enjoyable with his spinal stenosis. So. People are just really thrilled. I got this other picture, no comments there, but this guy actually designed some specific technology with three helpers that took her down into the into the canyon. So all sorts of things are possible. And just recently, back in August, uh, Todd Ackerman, our trail assessment trainer, uh, came out to the Grand Canyon, trained staff at the Grand Canyon how to use this equipment. This is our high efficiency trail assessment process equipment. There's the sensor box, it's measuring grading cross slope, a GPS, an encoder for the distance, and software that allows the collection of the grade and the cross slope and the tread width and distance and the surface information. And this all gets compiled into the trail access information. Uh, signage that, that can be posted out on the trails, hopefully. Again, I said none of this signage I found anywhere on the trails when I was there, so that would be the goal at this point, is that the park can get out there with this equipment that Move United uh, has helped purchase, purchase for the park so that they can get out and uh, do these assessments and create this signage and not just the the post signage, but also panel maps, because on the panel maps give an opportunity to show, like the the little one that I showed you for for that exists for the out to um, Hermit's Rest there, um, to have this type of signage that could show the whole South Rim and North Rim uh, Greenway uh, trail system, and then they can code each section of trail with different colors, and then have the trail access information. Uh, that you see zoomed in here, where you've got your typical grade, your maximum grade intervals, your typical cross slope, your maximum cross slope, your surface information, to have that detailed trail access information so that 
the people can make the decisions about which sections of the trail they feel they can do based on whether it's paved or not and the steepness and the surface firmness that they can make those sorts of uh, decisions. For all new trails, this is the signage requirements that the trail would have the length of the trail, the surface type, the typical and minimum tread width, the typical and maximum running slope, the typical and maximum cross slope, the date of construction or assessment, and the trail profile or location of any non-compliant features or obstacles. This information is available on those last two sections of the trail out to Hermit's Rest. And so this is the type of trail information we want to see on all segments at the Grand Canyon on the South Rim and the North Rim. So they've still got some work left to do to complete the system is to get this to get the information and It'd be good to have all this information available on the internet so people can plan their trips ahead of time and know, you know, how much time they want to spend on each section of each part of the trail system so they can actually plan what they're going to be doing when they come to visit the Grand Canyon. So thank you. Here's my email address if you have any more questions. Uh, um, I think Chuck's going to have a few questions for me here since I'm not actually there. Peter at beneficialdesigns.com. It's uh, been a pleasure to, to talk to you all today, and uh, greetings from Snowmass, Colorado. Candace, thank you. And um, I guess I'll, uh, if you can close that, I'll just go back to my slideshow. Um, fantastic. Okay. So, um, what a great presentation. And um, so um, appreciative of, of Peter being able to do that. Just a real powerful uh, testimony. Um, in terms of what we set out to achieve as Jeff defined with the overall vision. Now, uh, I'm hoping there's a lot of landscape architects, engineers, trail builders. <laughs> I'm getting some questions. Hagen posted a, a really good question for me to kind of cover in all this. As Jeff pointed out, what were we really trying to do? We were trying to develop a transportation alternative to the way in which the park was being visited. And that, that essentially meant we had to create a viable transportation alternative along the rim. And that alternative is about 11 or 12 miles in length now. Uh, when we went out in November, we, we probably went around 20 miles to see the entire completed system on the South Rim alone. Um, so key to this was tread surface. And uh, there was a real objection to the use of asphalt uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the knee jerk reaction is asphalt in the Grand Canyon. We don't want to put asphalt in the Grand Canyon. And we would agree, but we needed to create a wearing tread. We needed to create something hard because 5 million people visited each year. That's 10 million footprints. And there was a lot of damage being done to the high desert landscape, which is very, very soft. It's just not capable of absorbing that. And we wanted to move, you know, huge quantities of people across the rim. So, so the tread and the tread surface became very important. And what we discovered in looking at different tread surfaces was that the easiest hard tread surface for the Grand Canyon team, the crews to work with was asphalt. It was something that it was a material readily available. It could be put down, it could be patched and repaired. Um, it would withstand the rigors of, of this particular environment. You're at 7,000 feet you know, above sea elevation in a very, very um, you know, challenging environment. Peter wanted me to share with you that during his presentation, he talked about accessible. Um, and there was a section of trail that he encountered that was, there was a green line trail, there was an orange line trail. That orange line trail was considered a recreational path. And so he wanted me to share with you that according to the Architectural Transportation Barriers Compliance Board, while many shared youth paths are used for recreation, a path that is used primarily for recreation is not subject to those shared use path requirements that he talked about. So there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance to all of this. Um, but we wanted to get the trails out to about a 10 foot width for the purpose of volume. What the Park Service was more comfortable putting in was an eight foot width. So there's actually the width varies uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, corridor, uh, 11, 12 miles. So there is not a consistent width. And there's just a, cute, a couple of slides here just to show you the, the variable width. The other thing the Park Service did, which we, which we thought was great, was they put this natural sort of rock edging in, which we think was really critical because you're right 
you know, sometimes you're right on the edge of the rim and it's a mile drop. Um, we'll get to the Tuesian uh, section trail, the one that connects you down to Tuesian, but that was a trail that, uh, again, was probably in that eight to 10 foot uh, range. So that's what we were trying with, with, uh, with um, in terms of tread surface and tread width. The other thing was we had to meet uh, the, uh, all of the environmental laws. And so we had to develop a project that was NEPA compliant and we had to go through the NEPA process. So that, that was part of the delay. Uh, Jeff talked about, you know, we worked there for 10 years. We worked from 1997 to 2007 on a series of contracts and all of them went through the NEPA process. So there was a lot of environmental issues that we had to answer for. Um, and I'm hoping that members of, of my Greenways team are, are on the webinar. I, I think uh, Kimberly said she was going to be joining. Maybe, maybe Haley is joining, Matt, uh, uh, you know, others. Uh, but, you know, it was a real big team effort. There were a lot of us that were involved. The Park Service was involved. It was a really a great partnership, and there was a lot to address. One of the things that we wanted to do in terms of putting in an asphalt trail uh, and creating a new wearing tread and a single surface uh, or single trail width and trail surface that would handle all this traffic was to then go back in and restore uh, the landscape that had been damaged by all of the braided trails that existed for you know decades out there. I mean, people just continue to create their own pathways. We wanted to create a single pathway or at least an accessible pathway and a, and a parallel pathway, maybe two pathways. Um, and, and the Park Service was great about going in and a designating areas for restoration. So that was a real benefit that came out of deciding to go with this, uh, you know, single or dual tread system uh, that was going to be paved to handle all that traffic. And then wayfinding and signage was also a really critically important aspect of this. Um, and, you know, the Park Service has its own signage standards. So we were, you know, really needed to comply. But what, what we found was in 1997, when we went there, there was no information about how to get to the rim. Um, and so that, that began to really change. Uh, and now there were signs that pointed you to the rim. There's sort of today a bit of a mishmash of, of signs. Um, and wayfinding, I think, is still a bit challenging. We were there in November and we had a lot of people coming up to us, you know, just asking, you know, where, where to go to do this, that, or the other. Um, and they were right in the middle of, you know, of, of, the, of the park. So, um, you know, the problem with signage, we can get to a point of clutter. And so there's a real balance between, you know, doing wayfinding signage and, and you know, keeping it simple and, and, and effective, but also getting, you know, getting too much out there. Um, Jeff mentioned, I'm glad he did, the, the Trail of Time. That was a concept that we, that we launched as a result of the team's work. And now you can go out there and really experience the Trail of Time. It's, it's one of the really great aspects of, of walking along the rim. Uh, and the idea here is to bring uh, the different strata of rock right up to the, to the trail so you can understand how old some of this rock is, um, you know, where it might have uh, originated and how it, it, it constitutes you know, the, the Grand Canyon experience. Um, so the, the final thing I'll just cover is that there were a lot of different phases of construction. Jeff, Jeff mentioned the time frame that it took. Um, we did it, we, we did six total phases of, of work. Um, we did construction do uh, documents. We, we had those construction documents uh, submitted, uh, you know, through the NEPA process, through an evaluation process, and then sections of trail were built, you know, one at a time. The very first of these was built and dedicated in, in the late 1990s early 2000. And that was our first sort of a, a phase one rim top trail. These photos were taken by the National Park Service at the time, just showing, you know, this is before some of the edging went in, but this was the, the first sort of paving of, of, of the trail tread. Um, and that accomplished a lot of things that, that, that began to make connections along the rim possible. Um, today, if you walk this, th that is actually the greenway uh, according to the park's nomenclature, the Greenway is referred to as the uh, dual uh, sort of purpose path, wheeled and non-wheeled, whereas the, the recreation path, the rimtop trail, is just for walking. But Peter mentioned that we created these level landings. Uh, this is Betty Drake and Dan Burden, who are approaching 80. And, uh, you know, they were great uh, users of, of these level landings. I mean, you're 7,000 feet, and it's, it's challenging to walk. Uh, especially if you're older or you have any sort of physical limitations. And that was one of the things that, that we talked about with Peter. You know, there's a lot of people that actually go to the Grand Canyon that have physical limitations. Um, and we wanted to make this accessible for everyone in that regard. Um, 
phase two was a really important project because it was sort of like the main thoroughfare through the village. And so we created a greenway trail that you could connect uh, different activities, lots of activities on the South Rim. There was the Market Plaza. There was the new visitor center. Uh, there was the, the uh, Heritage uh, Campus where you, you, you stay, uh, basically the uh, El Tavar and all of the lodging. So there were a lot of places that simply were not connected with a, with a really high quality pathway system. And so that was phase two. And uh, that trail uh, was very, very welcomed by people who live and work at the park. They were able to now, you know, walk, bike, uh, you know, get back and forth without having to be in conflict with cars or without having to go out and use the, the, the rim trail, which was really a recreational trail. And this is a photo that was taken many, many years ago uh, that showed that uh, in progress being completed. And so that was an early phase. You know, Jeff gives so much credit to Jeff and Margo because Jeff said, you know, why can't you bike at the Grand Canyon, you know, and you couldn't. I mean, it was it was against the rules to do so. And, uh, you know, it's so funny when I look back because we were all scheming. We wanted to be the concessionaires. We wanted to put a, a bid in to run the bicycle concessionaire. But fortunately, Bright Angel Bicycles is, is a, open and, and very, very successful. And now you can you know, go and rent a bike and really bike the whole thing, which is what we did when we went in November. We, we never... We never used a car to get around. We we were able to park the cars um, uh, that we that we were using and just get bikes, and we were able to really you know cycle through the whole thing. It's a great system uh, for for bicycling, and uh, it's it both is along the rim and, and off the rim. And here's a here's a nice shot of, of Dan Burden and myself uh, basically uh, riding and, and enjoying uh, the the bicycle uh, access that was there. Phase three was the project that. Uh, uh, Jeff talked about, we, we wanted to, you know, it, it was in the general management plan to connect Tuzian uh, into the core of the park. And that actually was kind of tricky because it cost uh, crossed both Forest Service land and National Park Service land. Um, but eventually what happened was after we sort of got it kicked off, you know, the thinking was, well, this will be a natural surface trail. And that came out of our NEPA process. So the NEPA process was we were pretty much following the original two track is what it was called, which was the original road uh, system into the national park. And it might've been where Teddy Roosevelt, you know, rode, rode on horseback. It might've been where some of the original model A's or model T's, you know, trek. And so the original idea was, well, we'll keep that, that natural. But I think the park service and forest service realized, you know, that to, to keep the accessibility, you know, that we all had in mind, uh, it, it probably really should be paved. And so they did a joint project uh, connecting the uh, the park all the way into Tuesday. And here is, um, you know, Jeff and, and Bob and myself biking on this back back in November. Uh, and here we are with Dan Burden at the Tuesday and Greenway Trailhead right there in the village of Tuesday. And, and that was a major, major milestone to see that, uh, uh, you know, project completed. So that was phase three. But, uh, Jeff mentioned phase four at the North Rim. Um, you know, we kicked this thing off. It was the, it's called the old bridal trail and it bounced back and forth. There was a lot of, of terrain that we had to figure out how to navigate. You can see some of the switchbacks that were originally proposed in our initial draft uh, drawings. Um, and we wanted to make the North Rim accessible to the North uh, Kaibab Trailhead, which is very, very popular. Um, and here we are, you know, at the start, you know, taking all of our measurements. You know, I, I mentioned to Peter, we were talking about, Peter was in the process of sort of creating this nutritional food label, writing the access board standards. He was sort of feeding us stuff that was in draft form and we were putting it right into use. So we were taking the, the recommendations that eventually became part of the accessibility manual. And we began implementing those as best we could without any sort of uh, codification that occurred, you know, many years later. But this was that, that turnpike, that ramp that uh, Jeff had referred to that he kind of stumbled along. This is Jeff's photo there from 2007, um, you know, showing this accessible path. And this was essentially a recommendation that came from our team and the park service just went out there and implemented it. And that was what was so great about our partnership. You know, these were all sort of kind of somewhat experimental, had not been really uh, codified. They had, there was no precedent landscape out there. And so we were, you know, sort of plowing new ground, if you will, and trying to figure out how to create a more accessible, you know, wilderness landscape that, respected the environment, but also, you know, created more level uh, uh, places for people to bike and walk and address the needs of, of all people in terms of accessibility. Uh, the final two phases, you know, were sort of connection points. 
Um, these were l little tough areas that had to be trouble shot and, and over, you know, the, the trail, the rim top trail ended at this series of overlooks. And we wanted to get from those overlooks around the corner and out to the South, South Kaibab trailhead, which you could do today. Uh, the trail didn't exist at the time. And so we were out there. We actually wound up renting uh, survey equipment in Las Vegas <laughs> and then drove it all the way to the Grand Canyon and used it to shoot all the grades and, and you know, create grades. We just did not have good quality information. We wanted to make sure that we got it right. And then this is the finished product, you know, many, many years later. Um, so that was great. And then the, the final phase, it was the most challenging. And this was getting all the way out to Hermit's Rest. Um, and when Peter and, and, and Deborah talk with the Grand Canyon National Park Foundation, we, we all, and, and, the, and the National Park Service team, we all first encountered it. I mean, this is what it looked like. There was really not accessible paths. They were, um, they were in some cases, old Park Service roads that, that cars used to drive on. Um, and we wanted to, to transform those into completed trails. They have some of the most uh, unbelievable views of, of Grand Canyon, and it's a long distance trail. Um, and there were some attempts to formalize, you know, trails, but they were all, you know, natural surface or really, you know, old uh, sections of asphalt really beat up. But definitely, you know, Kermit's Rest was a place that people wanted to get out to. Um, so this was, you know, just to wrap this all up and we'll open it up for some questions. But, you know, this is um, our team in 1997 and one of our, our group shots. And, and this is our team, you know, a few years later in 2001. And this was our team back November. Uh, all of us a lot older and actually, you know, really uh, loving the fact that, you know, for us, we were able to create a really accessible pathway, you know, uh, there at, at, at Grand Canyon. Um, you know, Bob Searns, who also has a, a video that we'll play here in just a second, noted that, you know, working on the Greenway was, uh, you know, a great experience, uh, you know, on an iconic landscape, you know, not from a windshield, but, but fully immersed in an accessible, easy to use pathway. And it's a model, you know, for so many other landscapes. We hope it's a model uh, for other national parks uh, in our systems. Um, you know, Jeff has a book that he's he's uh, published, uh, The Third Mode, Towards a Green Society. A lot of the lessons learned are reflected in, in Jeff's book. Uh, and I also uh, have a book, uh, chapter four is dedicated to that, to that, to this project, uh, The Greenway Imperative. If you're interested in picking up those books and reading more about the details that we're not able to cover in an hour and 15 minute webinar. Um, so with that, um, uh, Candace, I'm going to let you maybe play the two videos that we um, acquired from from Bob and from Andy. Uh, we'll let them have their voices added to um, the, the team members who've spoken today. So I'll let you play those. Hello, I'm Robert Cerns. I'm a writer and Greenway and Trail Planner uh, developer, and uh, it was a great joy and honor to be a part of the Grand Canyon Greenway team. Uh, one of the things that particularly excites me about the uh, Grand Canyon Greenway and one of the projects that I uh, kind of focused on when we were working on that uh, project was a spur trail that connects from the gateway town of Tusian to the rim of the Grand Canyon. It's about a six mile route. Uh, goes through a lovely wooded area. You see elk along the way. Um, it's just a neat way to arrive in Tusi and not have to get in a car to get to the Grand Canyon, but rather just get on a bike or walk to the rim. And uh, you're rewarded by your uh, trip through the woods with the spectacular view of the Grand Canyon at the rim. Um, and then, of course, you can follow the main trail the Grand Canyon Greenway uh, that extends for miles along the rim. Um, that model, I think, has applicability to uh, other uh, national parks and iconic landscapes um, where people can access these places starting out in the gateway community. Um, and the entire experience within the national park or other destination is on foot or bicycle. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that really excites me. I'd like to see that idea spread to other places. Thank you very much. Hey everybody, I'm Andy Clark, Director of Strategy and Tool Design and a very proud but very junior member of the Grand, Grand Canyon Greenway Collaborative Team. What does the Grand Canyon Greenway Project mean to me? 
it means the triumph and of faith and hope and belief over just kind of shrugging your shoulders and wishing something different would happen. Actually, the triumph of getting out there and doing it, of creating something that 25 years on has served tens of millions of visitors to the Grand Canyon Greenway in a way that many of the projects envisaged in the same general management plan uh, will never do and have never seen the light of day. It's the triumph of something simple, straightforward, being very effective, being very easy to do, knowing what to do, just getting it done. Um, Honored to be part of the team, looking forward to going back year after year to celebrate its implementation. Thanks. Candice, thanks so much. Um, I know we've had some questions, which um, I've gone ahead and posted some answers to. One of the things I did want to reflect on um, uh, in the Q&A is that uh, the, the issue of being up against a, a really tr very dramatic, dangerous drop off. Um, how was that handled? Um, you know, I really did appreciate uh, how the Park Service has dealt with that for many, many years. And they put essentially what would amount to be a tow rail, uh, you know, a tow guide, uh, a, a shoe guide, um, a, a wheel guide uh, along the entire rim. So uh, that is and, and then there was the issue of how far to set back. I mean, you want to have that dramatic view over the the wall of the canyon but you you have to be careful about you know who's using it and how and um so there was a real effort to balance uh view shed and that thrill of you know looking over the edge of the canyon with public safety and um you know you don't want to put a lot of fences up and barrier rails and all that kind of stuff but you do want to put some sort of of uh you know guidance uh for public safety and i thought that the use of the edging rock was a good compromise in that regard uh, from a design standpoint. Um, you know, we, we walked a lot of it uh, and biked a lot of it as well. And I don't, you know, I don't know that we ever felt like there was a public safety issue out there from a, a sort of a casual point of view. Um, you know, there, there, there are other issues out there, which we won't go into today, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, more intentional, but, but I think from the standpoint of, of just casual, just normal everyday use, I thought that the design uh, solution was a good one. Great. All right. Well, I have a, a question um, I'd like to pose um, while we're waiting for additional questions to come in. But I know that this project um, was intended to be a model for change. And so what is your impression to how well that had worked? So I want to pass it off to Jeff first. Yeah, I think that's a really central question here. And, and I think institutionally, um, I think a lot of us would say we're still fighting many of the same battles um, in our communities and in, in the cities we have projects in and national parks and, and public places around the world. Uh, what we're talking about is far from mainstream, and there's still a long way to go to make that decision. You know, as Andy Clark just said a minute ago, this is the thing. It's it's cheap. It's easy and it works. And we know that it can be done and it makes millions of people happy when you see those people on Peter's video who have thousands of responses and the joy that they're able to experience. And you're never gonna experience that driving in a car. Uh, it's just not the same thing. When I think about the change at a different level though, and I think about sort of the trails movement and where we were then uh, maybe to where we are today, there are a lot of things that wouldn't have happened without this project. Had we not come together as a team and learned what we did from each other and fought through those difficult challenges, um, the Millennium Trails program wouldn't have happened. Um, the Razorback Greenway, you know, Chuck and Bob and Andy and I worked together on in, in Northwest Arkansas, which has been another sort of uh, catalytic project globally. Uh, the Empire State Trail, which we've just finished here in my home state of New York, and and so many other things. I think each of us as part of that team went on to uh, create tremendous change that's, that's had a, a huge ripple effect. But what I would like to see, and, and this is a challenge to everyone here, is back to that never give up mentality that the trails movement is built on a spirit of volunteerism. It's built on giving back, on creating that legacy every day on every project we work on and, and to keep pushing forward because the challenges the world faces right now, when you look at, at climate change and mental and physical health and dozens of others of issues, equity, accessibility, um, this is a way of addressing them. And it's not... It's not going to solve everything all at once, but it is a solution that works and we should be doing everything we can to make those decisions between this and other much more expensive, much less inclusive types of infrastructure to get built. So I think that's the challenge, not just to all of us here on the webinar, but 
but to agencies like the National Park Service and the U.S. Department of Transportation and, and organizations all over the world to realize that trails are a major part of the solution and that we have to keep making this movement bigger. And uh, Jeff, thank you. That's great. I, I just wanted to add one note actually from Peter. Um, he wrote me a very, very nice email and, you know, he's able to reflect for the first time in, you know, the, because life has slowed down a bit. And he was talking about how, you know, during this 10 year period, you know, he was in the process of writing these accessibility standards that are now, you know, really being adopted worldwide. And you know, this, the Grand Canyon became sort of a testing ground for these ideas and we were able to put them into into <clears throat> function right away well the park service won um a national accessibility leadership award for the work on accessibility and when you go out there today you realize what a triumph of accessibility it is <clears throat> in such a difficult uh, environment with difficult grades so that was uh, one of the really great achievements of the project well, we do still have some more time for Q&A. I know Chuck's been typing away, answering them behind the scenes. So thank you for that. Um, we do have, um, we're still waiting for questions. So before I do close it out, I'm just going to give you um, another minute just to see if there's any questions that people have. And Candace, while you're doing that, you know, people often ask where, where's the inspiration come from? And I, I know we've all been asked the same question. If it, if it was so hard to do, why do you keep doing it? You know, um, and, and that's a long Long question to keep thinking about, but you know we have to start every day trying to make the world a better place. And it's projects like this that make a difference. And, and you don't know if 25 years later, you're gonna be on a webinar uh, seeing the results of that work. But you know, I, I would ask everyone to go back uh, before we started on the, this project. There, there Again, there are people who've inhabited this region for a long time. Uh, there are people who we talked about the books that were written and, and one I wanna just uh, make sure I mention was Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire, which I, I got on that first trip uh, out west in 1990. And he describes this project. And that book was written long before he even knew that we would try to do something like this. And he talks about you know getting us out of our steaming hulks of steel and glass and experience the Rim of the Grand Canyon and Yosemite and other national parks. This should be the place where we most have the chance to do this. It should be the absolute best example of people interacting with nature in a positive way. And, you know, get a chance, read Desert Solitaire. He was there before we were, and there'll be people who come long after us. So it's uh, just part of a continuum of making this stuff happen. I did also want to mention, Candace, that uh, I recorded a 10 minute Q&A with Peter, which we'll probably not be able to play during the webinar, but I would highly recommend people log into the website and click on that Q&A because Peter covers more about the accessibility challenges and how they were resolved in that Q&A. And I think there's some real valuable feedback there as well. Great. Yep. And links to his presentation, um, again, in his Q&A, as well as both Andy and Bob's um, quick presentations are on the webinar's webpage. And I'll also include a link to all those videos in my follow-up email too on my resources slide. Now, I really hope that this this project, this, this webinar, this presentation hopes to maybe be a little catalytic in looking at some of our other national parks and other federal lands, uh, local lands. There, this was a real challenge to, to achieve all this. It, as Jeff pointed out, it wasn't easy. It was extremely hard. Um, but, you know, sometimes no good things come <laughs> unless you really, you know, roll up your sleeves and, 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 you know, get ready to dive in and fight for it. And um, I think that it's the project such a triumph when you go out there to the Grand Canyon now, um, moving around the landscape is so much easier than it was. I got a question earlier from Hagen as to whether there was a reduction in automobile traffic. This is, there's no data, you know, to prove this one way or the other. But I thought that the whole place felt a lot less car oriented and a lot less congested than when we started the, the project. Um, and that's been a lot of work by the Park Service over, you know, many, many years to achieve that. Um, you're able to kind of get all those cars off the rim for the most part, and really get out and experience the rim as a pedestrian, as a cyclist, um, you know, across a lot of the landscape. And so that I think is a really milestone achievement for Grand Canyon National Park. Um, and, uh, you know, th those are a couple of observations. We don't really have data, but those are some observations to share. Great. Uh, we'll do two more questions we have that just came in. Um, one from Lindell, are state and local park systems adopting the same accessibility standards? 
You know, the, the thing about it is, is that the, these accessibility standards, you know, were codified many years ago, probably two decades ago. And they're in the, all of the federal funding now that you get um, you, you're required to do this. And I think state and local, it's had a trickle down effect. So I think it's, it's now um, more normalized in part of the way that the design process works than it was 27 years ago. So it, it may not be as clearly stated, but, you know, and there's also been federal action. There's been Department of Justice action against communities or, you know, that haven't done a really good job of accessibility. So I think everybody's more, uh, aware of the fact that accessibility is a really big issue and that there are a set of guidelines that can be accessed and used for how to make accessibility, uh, you know, more achievable. And that's across open landscapes, that's across, you know, buildings, a variety of, of, of different landscapes. So I do think that while it may not be as clearly expressed, um, you know, codified, uh, I do think that you're seeing a lot more happening today. Great. Well, we'll do one more question here from Nancy. Did did you have to truck in a lot of fill to make the ADA grades work? We did not. There was a real attempt, Nancy, to sort of uh, look for pathways first that would be accessible. And sometimes they were on the rim. And sometimes, as Jeff and I observed, as we were on bike, we they, they peeled away from the rim and then were able to manipulate the existing grade in such a way to create the accessible pathway, if it wasn't up against the rim, you peeled away and you created the accessible pathway as a parallel trail. And you did that with earth moving equipment, but it was working with the existing grade, which we appreciated, you know, from a design standpoint, we really wanna work as much as we can with existing grade. That was clearly evident when you went towards Hermit's Rest. And that was one area that Peter, um, you know, when he got back, he learned more about it post visit than when he was there. And that's where we could use a little bit more signage, but they went into those existing grades and really worked with the landform to create the accessible pathway. So, you know, just to, just to note that it's possible to do that. Great. Let me just add to All that. Right. I, wanted to, I want to close with an experience that I think maybe will sum this whole thing up somehow. Um, I was remember it was with Bob Cerns and we we're out walking an existing power line uh, heading out towards, um, towards the Desert View Tower, trying to scout the trail in that area. And it was pretty rough going. We had a long day, you know, we're out, you know, basically bushwhacking. And uh, we came to a spot where we could sit over the rim, stop and get some water. And we looked down, you know, probably a mile into the canyon. And we could see two birds from that altitude. They were thousands of feet below us. And I said, I think if we can see them from here, th there's a chance those might be condors. And for the first time, either of us got to see California condors in the wild. Uh, numbers 87 and 92, I will never forget it. They flew right to us. We could read their wing tags uh, close enough that we, you know, we felt like we could touch them. And they circled us repeatedly for, a, for an extended period of time. And it was one of the most magical things I've ever had happen, you know, in, in the outdoors. And, and all I can think of is that, you know, if there was still a road with a bunch of overlooks and people were driving every half mile to get out, nobody would ever see an experience like that. And, you know, it's moments like that, 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 you remember for the rest of your life. And, and all we can hope is that there are now 5 million visitors a year having a chance to enjoy that experience in a way that wouldn't have happened before. And that those millions go back to the places they're from and say, let's do this here and let's make this happen. And I hope everyone seeing this webinar thinks the same thing. Um, greenways and trails are something that can happen in great ways and great places uh, if we have great people. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. Thank you, American Trails. Of course. Thank you both Jeff and Chuck and, and Peter and the other uh, video presenters here. Again, I want to also thank our webinar partners and include Visit Long Beach uh, Peninsula, the Professional Trail Builders Association, iZone Imaging, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as the USDA Forest Service. And this slide that you see here, I will be updating it to include all the videos, as well as links uh, to both Chuck and Jeff's books that they had mentioned or that Chuck had mentioned at the very end of the, of the webinar. So I'll share 
share that in my follow-up email again that I will uh, send within two days following this webinar. And if you are enjoying these webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for trails to 44321. I will do a monthly drawing for those that donate today to win our Trail Boss mug, our Happy Trails coaster and stickers. And if you do become a sustaining monthly donor or donate $50 or more at one time, we will automatically send you a mug and those items as a thank you. And we hope you'll be able to join us for next week's webinar in our Advancing Trails webinar series. And a reminder to subscribe and support American Trails to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash American Trails to get a notification when we go live every Thursday. Thank you again to everyone.